discussing inelastic neutron scattering from the unconventional superconductors with a strong focus on copper oxide superconductors because that's the general theme also for the uh, two uh, theory lectures um, today, yesterday. Um, we will continue this. Then um, we will discuss a second complementary technique that has emerged in the last few years actually as a very powerful um, probe of spin excitations in copper oxide superconductors, namely resonant inelastic X-ray scattering or short uh, RICS. Uh, and then we will proceed uh, to use the same technique to probe charge density waves in these materials, which were actually discovered uh, by accident um, in the course of these RICS experiments. Okay? And uh, probably we won't be able to finish this today, so we'll some of this charge density wave um, business will spill over into uh, tomorrow's lecture. So I anticipate this from yesterday's experience. Anyway, so um, I had already shown the phase diagram, Steve has shown this as well, uh, of the uh, copper oxide superconductors. Here is our favorite uh, copper oxide material, yttrium bearing copper oxide. You see two thermodynamic phase boundaries that have been established by specific heat, magnetization, other thermodynamic probes, uh, namely the anti kinetic state um, at um, zero doping, and then when you dope, you got about 5%, uh, you lose uh, D-wave superconductivity. Okay? And uh, this was the last slide I showed you um, yesterday, namely uh, the determination of the spin Hamiltonian including various super exchange interactions in undoped uh, yttrium bearing copper oxide. Um, this uh, sets the scale, energy scale, for spin fluctuations, uh, also in the doped materials, and the basic the primary energy scale governing the spin excitations is the super exchange between the nearest neighbor spins. Um, in the plane, which is anti and its magnitude is about 100 MeV. Okay. So that's, uh, uh, and then the, uh, the uh, bandwidth of the uh, magnon uh, spectrum here uh, is, uh, is about two times, well, it's four times uh, the spin um, times uh, this uh, exchange interaction, so it's about twice uh, altogether of this exchange interaction, so it's of the order of 200 to 300 MeV, depending on specific material that we're talking about. Okay, so that's the overall energy scale of magnetic fluctuations, which will also remain, as we will see, in the dope materials. Okay? All right, and the final thing I've shown you yesterday already is that when you have a dope the system, a static, a magnetic border persists at low temperatures, uh, but it's shifted to uh, increments of wave vectors. And this incommensurability is systematically uh, doping dependent. Um, and today we will uh, study a bit more uh, this so called spin density wave phase um, in uh, these lightly doped materials uh, using inelastic magnetic uh, neutron scattering. Okay? So uh, there was a question yesterday after the lecture about the term spin density wave. Uh, I've used it because uh, at high temperatures here, this material is actually reasonably metallic, well, badly metallic, uh, following uh, Steve's terminology. Okay, and uh, well, uh, some people call all magnetic ordering phenomena in metals uh, spin density wave. Uh, but that doesn't imply that this is a simple spin density wave as, uh, for instance, observed in chromium, okay, which is a weakly correlated metal. This, of course, is a very strongly correlated metal. And as a matter of fact, these materials become insulating at low temperatures, um, uh, which reflects the proximity to the uh, mod insulator. Okay? So you shouldn't think of them as uh, chromium-like uh, uh, spin density waves. Okay? Uh, so that was a bit of confusion perhaps um, following this uh, terminology. 
Okay, nevertheless, to you know, discriminate it, uh, this, this state here is centered at incommensurate wave vectors from the undoped anticommagnet, which is commensurate. Uh, I'll continue to use the term SDW um, so, um, in the following. Okay, so now let's have a look at the magnetic excitation spectrum in such a lightly doped incommensurately ordered um, material. Okay, so this is one example here. Uh, so we basically fill in uh, some oxygen atoms into the chain layer. I showed you the basic crystal structure of, uh, yesterday. And each oxygen atom sucks up uh, two electrons okay, to fill its uh, P shell and therefore donates two holes uh, into the copper oxide plane. Therefore, the doping level out of the copper oxide planes uh, increases to about 6%. You know, starting, in ref this is reference to the um, copper 2 plus uh, state with one hole per site. Okay? Uh, so here you're uh, adding a few more holes, about 6% more holes. Okay? So, uh, so when you look at this uh, spectrum here, okay, this is the intensity uh, versus energy um, measured by triple axis spectrometry. And now add this antipermagnetic ordering wave vector, um, pi pi, sometimes called pi pi, or reference to the uh, lattice parameters of the crystal graphic unit cells, we here called uh, half half. And there is some uh, um, z-axis momentum transfer because of the antipermagnetic order also uh, in the, uh, the z-axis direction, which I showed you yesterday. Okay? So when you look at this, uh, there are basically two features. One here is centered at zero energy, and that's analogous to the Bragg reflection um, you know, measured by elastic neutron scattering. Okay? So there's a Bragg peak uh, at this uh, weight vector here um, in the undoped um, anti magnet. If you see uh, something similar here, uh, except it's actually shifted uh, to slightly increments of weight vectors. Okay? Uh, and then uh, when, you, uh, when you go to uh, finite energies, uh, you actually see uh, a magnon excitation. Okay? And uh, you see also the difference here. There was another question um, asked yesterday about the well, how do you know that uh, when, you, when you look, when you set your energy uh, transfer to uh, E is equal to zero, how do you know that you're looking at elastic scattering, you're not picking up some scattering from spin waves due to finite resolution? Well, the answer is that elastic scattering is usually much smaller, much larger in amplitude than in elastic scattering. So, um, but nevertheless, you can actually detect these spin wave excitations um, in the undoped uh, insulator, they have small gaps, as we discussed yesterday, reflecting uh, spin orbit coupling, neutral crystal ring, and such. Okay. But um, no. the, the, uh, the doping, the finite doping here, is reflected only in a small shift um, from the uh, commensurate anti Here, you see. Uh, uh, actually inelastic scattering spectra now. Um, uh, basically, you're cutting across this uh, magnon excitation here, and you see um, that um, the, uh, the spectrum becomes broader and then splits uh, in the a-axis direction, whereas it remains commensurate in the e-axis direction. So, so this means that this modulation uh, in the uh, lightly doped material is actually uniaxial. Okay? Mm -hmm. What is H and K? Mm -hmm. H and K are the, are the momentum coordinates in the copper oxide layer. Okay? So you, you can write the momentum transfer um, to the neutron. This is Q. So U is in Cartesian coordinates H, K, L. Okay? And this is uh, these are the two coordinates in the, within the copper oxide layers. Okay, and you also see that when you increase uh, the doping level, okay, uh, this incommensurability becomes larger. This is actually very similar to what has been seen before in lanthanum strontium copper oxide. Okay, um, this is the second material in which this uh, 
increase, low energy incommensurate um, spin fluctuations have been seen, and recently um, they've also been detected in the bismuth based superconductors by Kazuya uh, Mada and his group. Okay, so there, these incommensurate spin correlations in light evoked uh, cuprates are actually universal, and as I said uh, yesterday, the incommensurability, uh, I think of this as uh, you know, as a way to facilitate the dope holes to move um, in the copper oxide layer without violating the poly principle. Yes? So just to make sure, so you're saying uh, as you dope the material, the uh, wave vector shifts from pi pi to yes. an mm -hmm. not that yes. you have another on top of the original. No, the wave vector shifts mm -hmm. slightly. So there's a slight modulation on top of this, um, uh, on top of the anti magnetic order. Okay. There are basically two types of modulations that are possible. One is sort of an amplitude modulation, okay, where the length of the spin varies from side to side. And the other is a, is a directional modulation, where the spin is sort of tanned a little bit from side to side. And uh, how would they indicate that it's the direction modulation is the dominant period? Okay. So by unilateral, you don't mean, you, you, uh, it doesn't mean that you only have way back in one direction. So it's still uh, the spin correlations are still, uh, are still centered at pi and pi, okay? But then on top of that you have a small modulation, right? And that is uniaxial. That's only in one direction. Okay, so the basic ordering wave vector is still pi pi, you know? Yeah. But so then there's a uniaxial wave modulation. I guess my question is that is that uniaxial spin modulation and the original pi pi modulation the same phase? or two phases added up coexist together? Um, okay, that's, or just one phase shifted a little bit? Ah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, so, uh, could there be, you, you're asking whether there could be a phase separation over some rate of doping uh, involving both, um, you know, where some fraction of the sample is in the commensurate phase mm -hmm. and the other is incommensurate. Okay, so our data indicate that uh, that is not the case. It's one coherent modulation. Okay, uh, so, uh, yes? Okay. There is old data from our version of ABU involved with mm -hmm. on less than 2% of LSCLs that did show phase coexistence. Yes, yes. I'm not saying that this cannot happen, right? But uh, um, and you cannot strictly rule this out. It's very difficult to rule this out completely uh, uh, based on, on these uh, uh, neutron scattering data because we have finite resolution, right? So, so let's look for instance here. Uh, you have uh, this, this the two peak structure can be described as a superposition of two incommensurate peaks, but there could also be a small commensurate peak uh, in the center that we cannot resolve, okay? So it's hard to rule it out completely, but uh, well, if you do a temperature dependence here at the incommensurate uh, wave vector, and you do a temperature dependence here at the commensurate position, the signal has the same temperature dependence. So, so there's no residue uh, of intensity that goes up to the AL temperature of the undoped uh, anticlimactic. Okay, so there's no uh, signal of this type. Uh, up at high temperatures, or 400 Kelvin is being the temperature of the anti magnet. That doesn't have to be in the system. Yes? Do I understand correctly that this is a finite energy difference? So fixed energy that is doing the momentum? Okay, uh, so this, these are constant energy cuts, actually. So at, at very low energies, at low, low energy transfers. Okay? You can also do this at zero energy transfer. And uh, so I will we'll get to that uh, in a moment. Okay. And it will look pretty much uh, pretty similar. Okay. Uh, so, so this is now, yeah, okay. Sorry, uh, low energy, you mean, is it the peak energy you showed in the, in the first slide? Okay, so, so this slide here has two features, right. okay? With, uh, and they both are centered at the same wave vector, okay? Okay. Uh, and uh, mm, the, these data here, actually, I didn't, Put it in here. It's, I just said low energy spin fluctuations. They are sort of cuts across uh, this uh, this energy uh, here at about three million electron volt. This magnon like excitation. Okay. But it's not at one half by one half. No, no. This is just that this data was taken at half half, right? Which is here the right. center point. 
and you see it just uh, just because we have uh, you know finite you know, these peaks have finite breadth. There's still some interesting here uh, located in, in the center. Why are there two peaks? Well, I mean you can, you uh, can do if, the, if you, yeah. So you can do the modulation with uh, plus q and minus q. It doesn't matter. So they're both equivalent. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you said earlier that the modulation can be due to the modulation of the magnitude or to counting. How do you identify? Well, this is very difficult, and uh, we still haven't you know, really completely uh, uh, finished this analysis. But you know, our present uh, uh, data. Um, what, what, what we've done is we've done some very careful spin polarization analysis. So we, uh, uh, we uh, polarized the neutron beam, um, spin polarized the neutron beam, and then um, we, uh, we spin analyzed the scanner beam, and then we carefully changed uh, the magnetic field at the sample uh, site, which, uh, which uh, sets the uh, neutron spin quantization axis, and then rotated this magnetic field with respect to Q, and then we went to different views, did the same thing. Uh, and uh, so um, the data uh, that we have uh, are consistent with it. You know, they can all be described, they can be described completely by a, a direction modulation, a spiral, you know, short range, what is spiral state within the complex events. You cannot completely rule out um, different modulations. So this is actually similar in the undoped, uh, in the weakly doped lanthanum strontium copper oxide superconductor, uh, where similar conclusions have been reached by the groups. So lightly doped materials seem to be uh, described by so spirals and conditions. Yes. Elaborate a bit more on the similarity of lanthanum. Uh, how similar is it actually at these low doping levels? Uh, the size of the rate of, uh, yes, the, 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 you know, the, 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 at these very low doping levels, up to about 5%, both materials are quite similar. The main difference is that uh, in YBCO, um, the uh, material is untwinned, and so we have untwinned crystal salt, so we can discriminate between A and B directions. Okay? In lanthanum strontium copper oxide, most crystals that have been investigated so far have been twinned, so you cannot discriminate cleanly between a uh, between um, sort of biaxial and uniaxial modulations. There was one exception, actually, by accident. I think this was for Poisoner's group um, uh, some time ago. Uh, just uh, just got a uh, untwinned crystal or, or nearly untwinned crystal, and they also um, uh, they also found. Um, Uniaxial modulation. Ah, and the, 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 the main difference um, uh, in the experimental observations is that in lightly doped um, LSCO, the modulation wave vector is along the diagonal direction. Okay, sometimes they've been crossed. Whereas here, the uh, modulation vector is, is along the A direction. Okay, so that's, that's the major difference in the observation. Actually, it's not the A direction with LSCO2, it's just the A direction. Yeah, yeah okay, so because it's orthorhombic, uh, so the A direction is actually uh, uh, tilted uh, uh, 45 degrees from the copper oxide port direction. So I should, I should say here in the uh, precise way of uh, saying that is why we see all its modulations along the copper oxide bond, whereas with lanthanum strontium copper oxide, it's 45 degrees away from the copper oxide. Okay. So, so this is just some uh, low energy spin spectra, and now we're going to go and uh, sit on this Bragg light peak. Okay. So, and I didn't call it Bragg peak here, but quasi elastic peak, and you'll see why in a moment, because it's not really truly elastic scattering. Okay, it looks like elastic scattering when you do standard neutron uh, triple axis spectroscopy. But when you uh, apply the spin echo technique that I told you about yesterday, um, you can increase your resolution to one microelectron volt, and then you actually see a finite energy width of this uh, quasi elastic peak. So this is, this is taken with a standard uh, neutron spectrometer, 
And you see here that this peak you know, sort of gradually fades out. Well, when you just look at this, you might say, well, uh, this is just perhaps a slightly disordered sample, so it doesn't have a shot the air temperature. So you see a range of the L temperatures, the L temperatures spread out, sealed out by this order. Okay. Um, but if you then uh, sit at this, um, you know, this peak and just monitor the line width, the quasi elastic line width, you see that it actually uh, narrows continuously from the cooling. Okay. The peak becomes sharper and sharper, but it never really is truly elastic down to the very lowest temperature. So this is, you know, you see gradually, um, a gradual narrowing of the spots in STP. And this is something that you actually expect for a two-dimensional Heisenberg model. We discussed this yesterday. So if you, uh, if you didn't have, you know, these spin space anisotropies or interlayer interactions, you would actually uh, expect precisely this type of behavior. Uh, namely a zero temperature phase transition uh, in the two-dimensional Heisenberg model. So it shouldn't come you know, really as a surprise to see this behavior um, uh, in the copper oxide materials. Is that uh, temperature dependence, the, the functional form you'd expect from the Heisenberg? Um, what do you mean? So, so this, is, we, we, this is just basically we fitted these curves to Lorentzians. Okay? And they, you know, they can all be described by Lorentzians at the, of the entire temperature range. So this function of the form of the decay doesn't change as much. No, I mean, I mean the temperature dependence of the line width or of the integrated weights or... Well, this is the temperature, this is the integrated weight, sure. okay? And this is the line width, uh -huh. right? So what happens uh, is that here, you know, sort of your, your line width becomes gradually broader and it move, sort of moves out of your uh, out of your resolution window. Okay, so so you have your um, uh, oh, this wet. Okay, so um, so you have intensity versus omega. So at, at low temperatures, you know your quasi elastic peak mm -hmm. is uh, uh, is very narrow. Okay, so it's and this is your uh, resolution. <coughs> Okay, your instrumental energy resolution. Okay, so at low temperatures, this peak is entirely contained in the resolution window. And then it, it sort of spreads out gradually and becomes uh, larger and larger. The line width becomes larger and larger, it moves out of your resolution window, and therefore the intensity that you're picking up here decreases gradually. That's what happens. Yes? So if you do it with the one micro EV resolution, mm -hmm. what does the intensity curve look like? Um, well, it looks it looks uh, similar actually because you're after all you're using a triple axis spectrometer, right? Uh, you, you you put your spin echo uh, coil on top of the spin echo uh, triple axis spectrometer. So so the resolution window of your triple axis spectrometer is the same as if you don't have the spin echo coil set up. Okay, but the spin echo on top allows you. Uh, to measure the, the, uh, the quasi-elastic line. So let me ask a different way. <laughs> the intensity of that quasi-elastic peak, if you find the full intensity of it, mm -hmm. is it changing with temperature, or is it just broadening okay. with temperature? Uh, it's, bro it's, it's, it's both, actually. It's changing, it's, it's increasing, uh, and it's broadening. So I guess, let me just rephrase the question. You are the energy scan from minus infinity to infinity through the quasi-elastic peak, instead of sitting on top of it. Huh? That's thing that yeah, integrated. Yeah, integrated. Yeah, integrated intensity also is going down. Yes. Uh, but but this is sort of accelerated because you know the um, the intensity is moving out of the uh, the resolution window. Okay. So but uh, but it's also the, the intensity centered. So the intensity of this peak also is going down as a function of temperature. But at the same time, it's it's broadening. So it's Increasing in intensity and it's broad. Okay, uh, so so this sort of shows you somehow that the uh, mm -hmm. that this two-dimensional incommensurate ordering in the light dot material is very fragile. You know, even a small uh, 
small heating <coughs> into um, broadens and, and affects this uh, quasi long range order uh, quite a lot. Okay? So this and this fragility of uh, these um, states that ultimately actually competing that, that, that compete with uh, high TC superconductivity that I think is a is a precondition for high TC superconductivity. So if this were a three dimensional uh, magnet and uh, and this uh, magnetic order would be much more stable, okay? and then superconductivity presumably would ne never be able to develop. Right. So so the two dimensionality. Uh, and especially the isotropy of spin space Hamiltonian actually is a um, uh, leads to fragility of um, of this competing state, uh, incommensurate modulated state, and of course disorder, which is unavoidable even with this material, also contributes and it actually frustrates uh, the uh, magnetic interaction, which leads to a further destabilization. This was actually shown by. T.S. Voita and others, um, uh, you know, incommensurately modulated state, uh, this order actually frustrates the interactions. It leads to uh, spin glass type behaviors, spin glass uh, freezing. Uh, and therefore, this regime uh, of doping is also often called a spin glass regime. Okay, so now uh, let's um, uh, let's again go back to the. Um, Finite energy transfers away from this quasi elastic peak. Quasi elastic peak goes away, you know, temperatures around uh, 30 Kelvin. Okay, and then uh, we're just dealing with these magnon-like uh, excitations, which are centered at incommensurate uh, wave vectors. Now uh, we've done the careful temperature dependence of these uh, excitations uh, and. Measured the incommensurability versus uh, doping, and found that this incommensurability um, uh, decreases continuously as a function of temperature, and then, um, uh, then ultimately goes to zero, at least within the experimental uh, resolution, which is de determined by the uh, by the width of um, of this um, of this peak. I showed you that these peaks are. Uh, not uh, infinitely narrow, but then finite width, and eventually when the commensurability becomes too small, um, uh, you cannot resolve, uh, you cannot resolve it anymore. Uh, and then, but uh, uh, when you still, when you, when you can still separate these two peaks, they follow uh, the incommensurability actually follows what looks like an order parameter, okay, that uh, uh, that goes to zero. At a temperature of about 150 Kelvin, okay. So, so even though there is no magnetic order in this material, okay. So the translational symmetry is not broken. Okay. The rotational symmetry uh, appears to be spontaneously broken uh, in the spin fluctuation spectrum. So the spin fluctuation spectrum already has this uniaxial anisotropy at temperatures much before uh, the onset of static magnetic order. Okay. So. In this regime, between at least between 150 and 30 Kelvin, um, uh, you're in a state in which the orientation symmetry is broken, but the translational symmetry is unbroken. Okay? And this is something that uh, had been predicted uh, by Steve Kibbelson and others, uh, actually for these measurements, and they turned it uh, in the matic. Well, first of all, Steve explained it yesterday. Uh, that in you know these complex um, organic fluids, uh, there's, uh, there's a state in which the, all these molecules uh, orient in the same direction, even though there's no translational crystalline order. Okay, and the same, you know, from the symmetry point of view, the same phenomenon also is uh, here. Okay, uh, there should be. Uh, I should make one caveat, uh, which is uh, that of course this. Material is actually slightly orthorhombic. Okay, so A and E axes are different. Okay, uh, but they're only different by a very small amount. So this orthorhombic um, crystal structure cannot be uh, the driving force of this uh, of this phase transition-like behavior. That's at least our point of view. Um, so rather, this orthorhombic um, crystal 
distortion acts sort of as a as an additional field, just like you if you if you apply a field to a ferromagnet, broadens the phase transition. Okay, but it still remains. You can still be allowed, so still allowed to call it a ferromagnet, even though you know, the, uh, the symmetry is already broken above the Curie temperature by applying the field. So this is this is uh, a way to think about uh, the role of this orthorhombic distortion uh, in uh, in minus zero system. Okay. Uh, there is some question. Yeah, just to clarify, uh, this. Incommensurability is seen at some finite end, right? Is, I'm sorry? It's, 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 it's observed at some finite end, it's not? Yes, yes. So this, this incommensurability here was extracted from these low energy spin fluctuations. Okay, so they're not, uh, it's the same incommensurability that eventually uh, characterizes the quasi elastic peak at low temperatures, but uh, here it survives, these, you know, its incommensurability survives even in the absence of any kind of static or quasi static magnetic order. Yes? Uh, in this incommensurability, just the wave vector? Yes, wave yes, it's the deviation from the pi pi. So it continuously changed from zero to. Yes. My other question is what about the doping dependence of this incommensurability? Ah, uh, doping dependence. Um, so I didn't. Um, so when you when you look at the, this incommensurability delta, okay, this uh, the weight vector uh, characterizing the incommensurable spin correlation can be written as q plus minus delta, uh, no, pi plus minus delta pi, right? Mm -hmm. And you plot by, uh, delta versus doping. Okay, it's zero. Um, in the under and the magnet, and then why is it still doing this? Okay, um, so up to, and this goes up. I, I will actually show a uh, plot uh, later on here. This goes to uh, a doping that is of the order of 0.08. Does it continue after it, it seems to, well, and then you know, these low energy spin fluctuations disappear. Okay, and then you see a, a big gap in the spin fluctuations. Sure, yeah. Okay, this is the same. Uh, uh, doping dependence, roughly at least, uh, as in the lanthanum strontium copper oxide family, except that in the lanthanum strontium copper oxide family, at low doping, you know, the spin correlation are rotated by four So it's pi plus minus delta, pi plus minus delta. Uh -huh. right. uh, yes? Is the um, crossover equal chart in the quasi elastic part of the cycle? Okay, so when you, when you look at uh, what do you mean? Uh, so, so this delta here characterizes both um, the uh, <coughs> unit. I'm not sure on that on that uh, plot. Um, that was presumably at three or four MeV. Um, this comes from the sleep operation section, right? Yes. Had some high energy, let's say three or four MeV. Yes. So if you go to the quasi elastic peak, how sharp is the crossover there? Well, that remains always incommensurate. Okay, so so over the entire range here where it exists, the incommensurability doesn't change. Okay, and it's the same as uh, for the inelastic spectrum. You know, it's it's all here. So in this range, incommensurability is is temperature independent. Yeah? So what's the correlation length of the incommensurability part and low temperature? Correlation length. Uh, it's well. Um, That's a few lattice spacings. It's not very large. Um, I forget exactly the numbers, uh, but you know, let's say roughly five or six lattice spacings. So it's still short range. Mm -hmm. It's short range. Right. It's short range order. But quasi elastic. It's quasi elastic, short range order. Yes. And <coughs> just one question about this delta versus x. So in in YBCO, if I'm not mistaken, so the orthorhombicity increases as you go. So this delta is going. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So this anisotropy is increasing the same way as the lattice, but certain you know transport anisotropies and the and, and the like are having actually going in the opposite direction of doping. That is, they the anisotropy increases <coughs> under doping. If I'm not mistaken. So do you have any comment on that? Is um, that just two contradictory tendencies or two opposite so, tendencies? Uh, let me let me try uh, to see. Um, so, 
you mean you're comparing the orthorhombicity, the crystalline orthorhombicity, and this uh, electronic uh, axle uh, modulus, right? I'm, well, I'm comparing the, the crystalline anisotropy, mm -hmm. that electronic anisotropy, mm -hmm. and other electronic anisotropies measured, for instance, in transport. Uh -huh. So two of them, one of these is not like the other. That is, it seems like the transport, the transport anisotropy increases with underdoping, but the incommensurability and the orthorhombicity decrease with underdoping. Well, sorry, how do you know that? So, sorry, this is from which? This is one big, one doping. No, this is he plotted it versus doping. Okay, now this I think there's there's really no. Uh, the, you know, in this regime of doping, uh, the um, transport in isotropy hasn't been as carefully determined as at higher doping. You know, so all this work by Louis Tadfer and others, uh, recent work uh, that was done at higher doping. Okay. So it's hard to compare this. I, I should uh, uh, more slightly, um, I have a slight caveat to my previous answer, which is about the correlation rate. Correlation length is also difficult to determine, the intrinsic correlation length, because you know, uh, this doping, uh, uh, this incommensurability changes with doping, and if you had slight doping in, your, in homogeneity in your crystal, then the peak broadens, you know, uh, but that broadening is inhomogeneous broadening, it's not intrinsic correlation length. Okay? So it's, that's why I was a little hesitant um, to, to quote you know, real intrinsic correlation length because it's hard to discriminate between inhomogeneous problems. Okay. But it's still, I think it's of the order of the Yes? So, operationally, I imagine sometimes it'd be difficult to distinguish the splitting of peaks when they get very broad. Mm -hmm. Right, they sort of merge together because both peaks get broad. How confident are you that that's not what happens at 150 Kelvin? That the peaks are just not broad or something. No, no, but we see the move. You, you, they actually are moving, moving together. 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 No, there's no joke. No, no. Okay. 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 Ah, okay. So, uh, I'm confused. So, uh, how uh, is phonon important right here? Phonons? Yeah. Well, um, we. You know that we're not dealing with phonons here because uh, you know they're acoustic phonons at low energies, right? But they uh, emerge out of the uh, nuclear bracket functions, which are different locations than uh, the magnetic bracket functions. Okay? I had one slide uh, yesterday where I compared a ferromagnet to an antiferromagnet, and you see that the point there was that the antiferromagnetic bracket peaks occur at different locations than the nuclear bracket peaks. And therefore, they can be easily discriminated. So, and uh, the same applies to spin fluctuations, which are centered at anti-magnetic bracket functions, versus phonons, which are uh, which are um, centered at the uh, nuclear bracket functions. So there's no. But plus, I mean, if you really want to, uh, if you really want to make sure that these are spin fluctuations, you can do spin polarization analysis, and that has been done in some materials and under some circumstances. Okay, so we really prove that these are spin fluctuations, not phonons. Now here at low energies, it's not a problem. Sometimes at higher energies, the spin fluctuations of phonons overlap. Okay, and then it's harder to discriminate. Sorry, just want to confirm. On previous slide, you showed intensity versus momentum. And there are two peaks on just one direction. Yeah. What's the energy? Is uh, this was, uh, this was three million electron volts. Sorry. Three millivectron volts. I so see. this is cutting across this uh, okay. spin rate. Okay? So it's the three millivectron volts. And what about the along B axis? Can we go to the next slide? That's also three millivolts. Yeah, no, there's all all at three millivolts. I should have put this somewhere in the graph here. Okay. And you still see a peak. You still see a and peak because these peaks, you know, the, the A axis peaks. Partially overlap. So there's still some intensity in the center. So when you go in the perpendicular direction, right, then um, you, know, you still pick up some intensity. 
So in other words, uh, you know, if you make a plot here, uh, with x uh, and y, this is the pi pi point. Okay, so this, uh, these peaks are centered here. Okay, but they're, they're uh, so they're so sort of broad enough uh, that um, they still generate some intensity at this pi pi point. Okay, so so the first scan here, log a star, is like this. Okay, and the second scan is uh, is like this. Right. And you still, you know, this, this intensity comes from the fact that these peaks overlap. Okay. That's why it's not zero. So is there yes. flexibility in the spin or the charge? It's in the spin, okay? Uh, so here in YBCO, the very light, uh, in, in light doping, uh, nobody has detected a incommensurate charge motivation. Okay? And that's the same in lightly doped methyl strontium hydroxide, as a matter of fact. At higher doping, you know, this uh, when you when you work um, at, along the bond direction, you see the stripe modulation there clearly need to have seen charge modulation, uh, but not at very low doping. Okay? Very low doping, all anybody has ever seen is spin modulation. So there's no evidence that uh, at these uh, of a charge modulation. Uh, at these very low Okay? Uh, uh, um, so there is no doping that can be used in this matter. Yes, no, what? Sorry? We have looked at other doping levels. Uh, well, we've looked at a series of doping levels. Uh, so these are just two of them. Uh, right? But we have uh, looked at several more. Yeah. So, so it's a what happens to the pneumatic water? Ah, what happens to the pneumatic water if actually the, uh, the temperature, you know, at which this pneumatic watering temperature actually goes up when you go to a, a lower doping? But when you increase the doping, it increases the doping, it goes down, okay? Yeah. No, but once it's spins up, you can't look at this. Uh, I get that, that, you know, the magnitude goes up when you increase the doping. The onset temperature goes down when you increase the doping. Uh, the magnitude of what? The magnitude of data goes magnitude. up when you okay. the plot you have uh, the mag Yes, the magnitude the of delta goes up. goes up, okay? The temperature, the temperature the actually goes down, down. okay? <laughs> temperature goes down. So you uh, you can uh, plot, again, versus doping, the onset of the pneumatic Uh, and this is all in this uh, paper, actually. Uh, this, this paper here, it's a very long paper. It has a plot of uh, the magnetic watering temperature. Well, we only have done this for three samples, but it actually goes up uh, slightly from uh, 150 to, say, about 200 Kelvin. And we go from uh, you know, 6% to 4%, something like that. And then, yeah, around 8%, uh, you, uh, you actually lose these low energy spin fluctuations. And then, uh, well, also this mathematic phase transition disappears. Okay? And that, that's something that I will uh, get to in a moment. Okay? So, oh yeah, and then uh, this is just some theoretical work. Um, how, do you, how can you think about this? Um, no, pneumatic order in a metal, okay? And I like to think about it uh, in terms of this Pomerantia instability. I mean, there are various ways of looking at this, in real space, in momentum space. Steve's early work was, uh, was uh, based in real, uh, real space um, language, but uh, there's a lot more complementary way of looking at it. Um, just find the, these people here, uh, they just start from a two-dimensional Fermi surface, a square like Fermi surface uh, near a Van Hoff singularity, and there is actually a stability uh, in which uh, this Fermi surface is, is Fermi surface spontaneously distorts and forms an open Fermi surface like this, like the dotted lines. Okay, that's 
so-called Lagrangian instability, where a Fermi surface distorts, but there's no magnetic or charge order associated with this. So there's no translation symmetry. Right? Okay? And uh, as I said, you know, there's some early work uh, by uh, uh, Luigi Ando in, and there's, you know, there's only a little bit of overlap with uh, uh, the um, magnetic scattering data uh, that we collected, but in this overlap, was actually an increase of the resistivity and isotropy um, now around a similar temperature range, in a similar temperature range, maybe 150 Kelvin, where we see this uh, nematic uh, phase transition, or the incipient nematic phase transition. Okay, so now we're going uh, towards uh, higher doping, okay? And this is the last sample here, entrium barium copper 6.45, uh, where we actually see a the quasi elastic peak at low temperatures. Okay? So um, that's around 8% of doping. Here, uh, we've done a, a careful temperature dependence at uh, different um, excitation energies here, spanning a wide range. Okay? So this is the dynamic stability at these uh, energies as a function of temperature. Uh, and it turns out that you can collapse uh, this entire. In a data set on a single curve here. Well, it's almost the entire data set, except for very lowest energies here, P and V. They don't fit, uh, but the rest of the data uh, fits very nicely to a single uh, curve uh, as a function of this scaling variable omega over t. And this omega over t scaling, uh, that's a signature of quantum criticality. Okay? Yes? Uh, it, it, yes, uh, this here is already in the superconducting. Uh, some of this data are uh, taken in the superconducting state. Yes. Uh, TC of the sample is around 30 or 40 Kelvin. Okay. I can tell you the precise number. So, uh, so this lowest energy uh, uh, data don't don't fit here. Uh, and that's probably a signature also of this uh, pneumatic phase transition, which involves low energy scaling. So, okay, so this quantum critical scaling, or we only know the T scaling, that's actually a um, you know, signature of quantum criticality. So, you know, all the phenomena that we see uh, in the spin fluctuations here uh, around this point are consistent with uh, a quantum critical point. So, this quasi elastic peak intensity you can regard as an order parameter actually goes continuously to zero along this point here. Um, and you see in the dynamic susceptibility this omega scale, which, uh, for which I think the uh, quantum criticality is the only uh, reasonable explanation. So, so we have good evidence that there really does exist a quantum critical point here as opposed to some kind of crystal transition. That was a question that was raised yesterday. Um, yeah, just to clarify, so the, the order parameter corresponds to this the this incommensurate spin density way of characterized by the quasi-elastic peak. But if I were to be a stickler, that should really be a Bragg peak if we wanted to call that an order parameter. So um, is, is your well, that it becomes a Bragg, Bragg peak at zero temperature. Okay? Okay. So when you look at zero temperature here, you actually do have some static order, right? At, at zero temperature. So, sorry, the, the, the correlation length in space also. Uh, the correlation length in space is not infinite, right? Um, it's hard to determine exactly what the correlation length is because it's possible in homogeneity, uh, but it's certainly not infinite. Okay? okay. So, mm, so that's not. But it's that order, 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 even at mm, zero. It's not, it's long not range truly order. long range order. Okay. You know, that reflects the fact that these materials are not perfect, right? So we have some disorder. Uh, it's, it's a spin glass, you know, mm -hmm. it's a, a spin glass order parameter. You can probably define a spin glass transition. Anyway, you have static order here uh, with a static order parameter uh, at zero temperature, which disappears here at this point. Uh, and that you know, is, is uh, a signature of quantum, uh, quantum phase transition in the presence, of course, of disorder. And how to describe such a the quantum phase transition, the presence of disorder, then I think is perhaps a good research problem you know, to worry about uh, a disorder, which I think is 
It's really essential if you want to get a full understanding of the phenomenology of spin and charge order. So you cannot neglect this order disorder. Yes? Well, I, I understand that the spin charge is a Cartesian order, but yes. how complicated is to define the boundaries of the space? Well, it's not a trained thermodynamic phase. I mean, this is why I didn't draw a you know, black line. You know, this, uh, it's, you know, it's a series of crossovers. Okay. So even this pneumatic phase transition, it's not really a true phase transition. There's no specific heat anomaly. Uh, you know, one origin of this is the orth one big crystal structure of this material. So it's not a true phase transition. It's a crossover. Uh, and then there's another crossover where this quasi elastic heat turns out. So, so no, it's not. Therefore, it's, I, I put this shaded region here, um, and I don't call it a thermodynamic phase. I see, but, well, so everything is smooth, right? You see this temperature going to zero at some point, and mm -hmm. I so. Mm -hmm. so there's a series of more or less sharp crossovers, right? So, so I think you can see the you know vestige of a phase transition here in this uh, intermissibility versus temperature, but it, it's not a true phase transition. I see. Yeah. And so it, it, uh, this dynamatic that you comment on as function of doping, you don't see it going down to <coughs> lower concentrations, right? It always goes up um, towards zero doping. So the, the pneumatic phase transition, well, I mean, it comes with, you know, fairly sizable error bars, you know, very exactly, you know, you would put your pneumatic underlying uh, transition temperature of this of this pneumatic phase transition that actually goes up with a decreasing doping. Okay. Still not satisfied with this? That, no, I think yeah. So for the left side boundary, that would, at some point you get um, commensurate phase. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Okay. A crossover to commence with. Yes. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So this is just a cartoon. Okay? Uh, so don't take this, you know, this shaded region too seriously. Um, so, you know, if you want to, if you really want to understand what's happening there, you need to go back to the original data. Okay. But uh, yeah, over this range here, you have nearly critical spin fluctuations that are present in the material, and there's a series of crossovers to quasi-static order uh, at uh, low temperatures. Okay, so now uh, let's, uh, well, okay, uh, so let's uh, take a step across this point, which is point, see what the spin fluctuations look like there. Okay, so this is now beyond the critical point, the critical point, the YBC 06.6, about 11% uh, uh, doping. Uh, and here, in the normal state, this is at 70 Kelvin, just what you see, uh, you see actually very little uh, uh, spin fluctuation temp intensity at low temperatures. Okay? Remember that in the, uh, you know, in the uh, samples with lower doping levels, there's a lot of spectral weight here, mag-on-like spect spectral weight. This all disappears, and there's sort of a, uh, a gap. It's not a true gap, right? Uh, but it's, uh, you can call it a pseudo gap. Yeah, this is pi pi. Hmm? Uh, this is pi pi. This is pi That opens up in the spin fluctuation spectrum. So, so these spin fluctuations are actually uh, uh, gapped out at, um, at uh, low energy. So that's actually what you expect beyond a quantum critical point. In a standard quantum critical point, um, in the magnetically ordered material, you see. Um, that in the quantum paramagnetic phase, there's a gap in the spin fluctuation spectrum. And I like to think about this pseudo gap as you know, um, the, a gap, like the whole gap in a uh, one dimensional material, which is a signature of this quantum paramagnet. Here, of course, this is a metallic system, so it's harder to describe, but, um, but it's only, you know, it's, it's consistent with a, the notion of a quantum critical point. Uh, separating um, uh, a state with uh, static magnetic order at low temperatures from one that is disordered at low temperatures. Okay. And then, so that's in the normal state, and in the superconducting state, then you see a very large renormalization 
of uh, the spin fluctuations. Okay? So suddenly you get a very sharp peak, uh, which has come to be known as uh, magnetic resonance. Okay? Now, uh, this type of behavior is also seen in other unconventional superconductors. Um, so this is, this is here the, um, uh, the data that I just showed you. This is data in uh, an iron arsenate superconductor with a somewhat lower TC. The, shift, the peak is shifted to lower temperatures. Uh, but it actually has almost the same uh, intrinsic spectral weight uh, as the um, and the spin fluctuations here in the, in the white solar system. So it's a very similar phenomenon. And you know, uh, we think of it as a uh, feedback effect of the superconductivity, um, you know, the um, pairing interaction on this intermediate boson, which in this case would be spin fluctuations. So I showed you that as you know, a latent feedback effect in phonon driven superconductors, which is very, very subtle. Um, uh, below TC. And uh, here, this feedback effect is much, much larger. And that's because, um, basically, this is because these, you know, these bosonic collective modes are also uh, generated by the same electrons, uh, which form a group of pairs. So uh, it's natural for these feedback effects to be much bigger right, than, than in the phonon driven superconductors, where the phonons are sort of a separate reservoir um, that exists even uh, without the effect. Okay, so here, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the full energy momentum dependence of this magnetic resonant mode. This was just here cut at the high pi weight vector. Okay, so this is, this is a picture uh, showing full dispersion relation, which is sort of comprise, which comprises two pieces. One here at uh, high energies. That just looks like uh, the magnets in the uh, undoped insulator, but now with a gap, uh, and the gap is totally dependent. And in this uh, this system here, uh, it's of the order of 30 millimetric volts. Okay. And then uh, at low energies, uh, there is another branch of this uh, dispersion relation, which is sort of inverted with respect to the magnetic dispersion relation. Okay. And the whole thing here is centered at the pi pi wave. So that's the phenomenology of this magnetic resonance mode. It turns on at TC. Above TC, everything is broad. Below TC, it emerges as a very sharp excitation. Now, uh, how do you think of this mode? Well, the simplest way to think about it uh, is uh, based on you know, just a non interacting electron system. Okay? Non -interacting in a non-interacting electron system, you can describe the magnetic excitation in terms of this accessibility here, um, which is known as the Lintard function. It's just basically um, you know, incoherent spin type excitation. So you promote an electron from one uh, occupied state near the Fermi surface to another unoccupied state um, at a different momentum, um, also close to the Fermi surface. And then uh, you have these two Fermi functions with an energy denominator. Uh, that's your Lindhardt function. It's very broad uh, and spread out over an energy range going from zero to uh, energies of your of the Fermi energy. Okay? Now, uh, this would be this, these types of single incoherent single particle excitations would be uh, much too weak to actually be observed with a neutron scattering. So the very fact that we see spin fluctuations with substantial spectral weight, actually spectral weight comparable to magnetic excitations in the under material, uh, means that this you know, type of model can only be a starting point. It cannot be give you the full um, uh, full description of the, um, the spin fluctuation spectrum. Uh, also, um, you would not actually um, generate these sharp uh, collective modes in the state. So what people have done, the simplest way beyond, step beyond this simple model, is to normalize uh, these um, um, the spin type function uh, in an RPA expression. So uh, I'm sure that uh, the theorists uh, here can explain you exactly um, how uh, this can be done, and what has been done. I'm not going to uh, focus too much on this, just to 
to uh, uh, indicate that this interaction function here is actually peaked in the group rates at a high wave factor um, based on the observation uh, that these low energy spin calculations actually remain centered at pi pi. How would you do that? Um, you need to take uh, one, when you, you want to describe the resonant mode uh, in the superconductor state, you need to also uh, take uh, superconductivity into account. And the way uh, this can be done actually is, uh, is to just write down uh, the covalence factors, so the full dynamic accessibility in the superconducting uh, state actually consists of three different parts. Uh, one is just scattering the thermally excited quasi particle pairs. Okay? Um, and then uh, there are basically two, uh, two additional terms. One is um, uh, annihilation of um, thermally created uh, um, quasi particle pairs. And the third one is uh, pair creation. Okay? They all have different coherence factors. If you look at the coherence factor, and we're, we're actually um, at low temperatures, uh, only this uh, term here, pair creation term, is relevant at, at low temperatures. And then we, we look at this coherence factor, you re we realize that it's only non zero if uh, the superconducting energy gap uh, changes sign uh, at the room surface. Okay? So, um, in this uh, sense, the uh, observation of this magnetic resonant mode is actually an indication uh, of the sign change of the superconducting gap function. Of course, there are, by now there are, there are better ways of actually directly determining uh, the D wave nature of the pairing wave function. Okay, so we can, do, uh, we can do this directly by Josephson effects, etc. This was done around the same uh, time as at which we, um, uh, at which we uh, uh, studied this resonant mode, okay? so, and that's more direct. Uh, but in the iron pictides, actually, this mode um, is still, I think, the best evidence, along with um, the positive interference experiments in SDM, uh, that this theoretically predicted sign change of the superconducting wave uh, gap function actually does happen in these set of materials. Okay? So, um, so, in other words, neutron scattering is actually a phase sensitive probe in the sense of the superconductivity. Okay? Now, um, there have been quite a lot of uh, theoretical um, treatments of this magnetic resonant mode starting from various different approaches. The simplest one is really this RPA expression, uh, which generates uh, such a collective mode here. Uh, it's a triplet exciton uh, that lives inside uh, the continuum, uh, inside the gap, uh, inside the superconducting gap, which of course is momentum dependent. Okay? In, so it has, it's, it has D wave form, but it has a strong momentum dependence, and therefore uh, this resonant mode has a strong dispersion. This is one uh, particular picture here, which uh, this mode dispersion is. They're produced by a simple RPA uh, calculation. So, so that's the that's the uh, 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 lower branch of this uh, uh, resonant mode dispersion. That's sort of the signature uh, of the uh, D wave nature of the superconducting community. Okay, um, I'm just a little confused about this the collective mode. You label an energy gap two delta, but the D wave is nodal. So this is at some fixed momentum? Uh, yes, it's at some fixed momentum, namely pi pi, right? Okay. This is where the, uh, uh, at pi pi here, uh, this is the superconducting energy gap, right? Um, you know, at this, you know, at the, at the uh, uh, points of the Fermi surface, uh, connected by the <coughs> high rate. Okay? And um, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, this connects the, uh, the uh, antinodal points um, of the degree gap function. When you when you go to uh, to smaller momenta away from pi pi, actually you're moving towards the nodes, and therefore the gap decreases. And therefore, you know, this mode dispersion which sort of hugs the uh, continuum of uh, the single particle incoherent spin flips also goes down. Okay? So that's the basic explanation of this inverted dispersion. So now. There are various ways of looking at it, but you know, I, 
I like to think of this RPA as the simplest way to actually describe in a reasonably quantitative way uh, this resonant energy spectrum. Okay, so now when we go to higher energies above uh, the new resonant energy, okay, uh, there uh, we, we still see spin excitations, and they look more and more like magnets in the insulated parameters. Okay? And uh, at these high energies, uh, well, you can look at uh, you know, different families of high TC superconductors. These are just two of them. Why we see over the anthem strontium copper oxide families uh, at similar doping levels. And they all show a very similar signature. Uh, this is a you know, constant energy cut um, of the spin excitation spectrum. And you see these uh, square shaped patterns. Um, which then expand um, and when you go to higher and higher energies in a similar way as the spin waves, spin wave cone that emerges out of high wave vector expands and go towards its own boundary. Okay? So these high energy spin excitations are really quite similar in all different families of the uh, IGC superconductors that are universal. They're also quite weakly temperature dependent um, and not very strong dopamine. So the universal spin So now the question is, well, we want to you know, do something with these spin fluctuations. We've reported them, we've uh, shown them in, in papers, etc. But now what do they actually mean for ITC superconductivity? Yes? So before I continue, I'd like to ask, um, if everything else was the same, so if everything else was held fixed, uh, say let's say the residual reduction between the quasi particles, then the energy of the resonant mode would track the maximum gap. Yes. Does that do that? Um, well, that's a subtle question because the, you know how do you determine the gap, right? Uh, so there are different different gaps uh, in your uh, in your spectra, in your photo emission spectra, um, and you know the resonant mode energy certainly does not uh, track the pseudo gap, right? Um, but it it does follow what you might you know. Uh, it does follow TC. Okay, so it's uh, the mode energy is proportional to TC, uh, at least roughly proportional to TC, um, which you might expect a you know, BCS-like uh, gap to also be. Okay, so so the um, so the mode energy uh, is actually consistent with uh, with what you might expect the superconducting gap to um, to, uh, to do as you mentioned. I just want to mention the fact that at one point the Sakinsky showed data for SIS standard. Yes. Which he tried to extract the effect of the mode on, on furnace. Mm -hmm. And he claimed that if he goes to progressing the overdoped materials, the mode frequency uh, approaches to the Yes. So uh -huh. Uh -huh. This is also what we see in the neutron scan. Okay, so uh, in the overdoped machine, uh, oh, okay, so this this uh, dependence of the uh, of the mode energy actually tracks the superconducting energy going down. Yeah? Um, so it goes uh, in the overdose regime, it goes down and, uh, with increasing doping, and this is this is the uh, effect that uh, that Andre mentioned. That you know, okay, so in the overdose regime, uh, the gap goes down, and the mode and this interaction, you know, quasi particle interactions become weaker. Um, and therefore, uh, the mode actually approaches the, you know, the uh, particle hole continuum threshold. So, so pi pi nests the antinodal points, but the energy of the resonant mode does not track the antinodal gap. Is that correct? Um, uh, well, the ant if, if you the antinodal gap is then the pseudo gap. Right? Right. Yeah. Right. It doesn't. You know, it doesn't practice. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Okay, so now, uh, so this this part of the, the talk uh, may be a little more controversial, uh, especially among theorists. Um, but you know, we uh, we've been bold enough to actually uh, use these spin fluctuations um, that we observe experimentally, and that we also observe to strongly couple to super. Activity, which is feedback effects, 
in a very simple and probably hopelessly naive calculation, and we just a simple Eliasberg theory uh, similar to owner driven um, supercomputers. Okay? And so uh, the uh, motivation here is that these spin fluctuations and moderate doping are actually yeah, they're not critical. So if we were uh, very close to an anti critical point, nearly critical spin fluctuations, this type of calculation would certainly be uh, completely inadequate. Okay? But uh, here in these moderately doped superconductors, extending up to optimal and overdoped um, uh, superconductors, these spin fluctuations are actually not critical and they're gapped. So they're not actually fundamentally uh, different in the sense of performance. So you know, this is why we, uh, we felt old enough. And plus, you know, at least um, in the same doping range, at least at low temperatures, um, uh, in the normal state that you're induced by a magnetic field, people have actually observed fermionic quasi-particles. Okay? So, I mean, uh, it's per perhaps not totally crazy to look at uh, what happens if you plug this experimental observed spin fluctuation spectrum uh, into a an Eliasberg type calculation. Okay? And what, our motivation is that we really want to understand the mechanisms that limit, determine the TC and the energy gap, you know, as a guideline for materials design. We would like to manipulate TC. And we have some ideas how to do that. Maybe I'll, talk, uh, I'll tell you about this tomorrow. Uh, and we'd like to have some kind of guideline. What should we do? Which parameters should we change uh, in order to maximize the see The only way to do it at the moment is this and the aspect view. Okay? So now uh, our first step here was to just do a, uh, take a single, single sample, this YBC 0.6.6 sample, and do two sets of energy and momentum result experiments, maybe one neutron scattering, and then um, angular result of emission spectroscopy. Um, I should say, by the way, that our pass uh, on YBCO uh, is uh, very difficult because of surface issues, but um, the, uh, our collaborators at Dresden, they managed to get a reasonable um, uh, set of data, not quite as beautiful as the ones that and Dessau and others um, are getting at uh, you know, more physical based superconductors with much better surfaces. But anyway, uh, it was good enough for this, um, this study. So, where we basically uh, did a quantitative comparison between these two dust sets of data. Uh, and you know, this was parameterized in terms of this uh, simple Eliasberg theory. And then we could see, for instance, just by kinematics. Uh, as I just said, spin fluctuations here at pi pi uh, connect the antinodal regions of the surface, and then these higher energy spin fluctuations, uh, they connect points um, that are away from these antinodal points. Okay. So there's, we can, um, we can um, uh, match these two data sets in terms of the simple RPA theory. Um, and then uh, if you, if you uh, uh, Take the simple spin fermion type uh, calculation. These you know, magnets are coupled by a coupling parameter uh, to these fermionic quasi particles. And uh, you know, by fitting a combined fit of these two excitation spectra, we can extract a fermionic coupling constant. And we actually managed to, to obtain a full fit. This was done by uh, Thomas Dahm. That's a famous. Uh, with a very reasonable fit of, um, uh, of uh, the R full RPES dispersion relations based on just a single parameter you know, and an experimentally observed neutron scattering spectrum. Okay? So, so this is just one uh, cut across this uh, spectrum here uh, showing um, the, as a line uh, the fitted uh, curve uh, using this particular spin fermion coupling constant uh, and there are you know, various other cuts that look uh, similar. The full emission data, as I said, are not quite as pretty as some uh, data on some, some of the other compounds. But in any case, uh, we actually, from this, uh, from this mean field 
um, analysis, we extract the transition temperature of 170 Kelvin, which is not you know, uh, very close to the experimentally observed TC. But on the other hand, it's also not extremely far away. You know, it's not one Kelvin, it's not a thousand Kelvin, it's the same order of magnitude. And actually, it's comfortably bigger than uh, the experimental observed TC. And there's, of course, lots of reasons why uh, TC should actually be lowered in the um, actual real material compared to the predictions of this mean field theory. One of them is just ordinary thermal fluctuations, which in two dimensions, of course, are uh, quite relevant and tend to lower ordering temperatures quite a bit. So our conclusions from this uh, was that these, this particular material, uh, spin fluctuations appear to have uh, high enough strength to mediate the uh, ITC superconductivity. Okay? But, of course, uh, we got uh, immediately quite a lot of criticism, uh, not only because of the uh, primitive nature of the theory, which relates vertex corrections, etc., uh, but also because um, at um, uh, optimal doping, um, it turns out that there are uh, you know, spin fluctuations at these and these higher energies are actually appear to be weaker. Um, and actually, at optimally and optimally doped YBC or seven, okay, the highest TC, uh, uh, we and others have not actually been able to see the spin fluctuations at high energies. It was sort of resonant mode in this material because it's very, very strong class presentation, but we were able to, to resolve um, high energy spin fluctuations, which, uh, according to this theory, actually play a significant role also in um, supporting the fantasy Okay, so now, sorry, just, just to clarify yes. that, the RPS measurements were in the normal state? Both normal and superconducting state. And the superconducting gap actually uh, was <coughs> observed in these materials, so you know, people could actually observe the superconducting gap. Okay. So and the and the superconducting gap and all the renormalization of the superconducting state look very much uh, similar to in, in, to the physical phase superconductor. So that gave us some confidence that these data are not was just uh, completely um, dominated by surface issues. Okay. And just to clarify, the input of the RPES was basically into a dispersion relation or some their Fermi liquid Hamiltonian interaction that goes into the Ailey Ashford theory. It wasn't. It wasn't taking into account this complicated smeared quasi particle business, right? No. Okay. No. Okay. No. Okay. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. The effect of Arcus is to extract self energy, which was then put in the Ailey Ashford equation. Uh, was it? What was the other? What is Okay, so what was not really part of this calculation was this uh, Fermi arcs um, uh, and the, the super gap. That was not uh, taken into account. Okay, I thought this is what you meant. Um, okay, that was one of the criticisms, of course, uh, that you could apply to this kind of calculation. And of course, uh, when you look at the upper spectra, it does have the super gap, um, and that's not taken into account. Okay. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, I think of this, well, maybe it's naive, but I think of it, you know, the pseudo gap as, uh, you know, um, as a one you know, way to actually lower the um, um, TC compared to this naive prediction, because that's probably quite heavily influenced by competing work. As I, uh, I will, I don't think I have time actually to, to move towards the charge density wave story, but the charge density waves actually depress uh, the superconducting transition temperature uh, compared to this naive field prediction. Can you remind us what portion of the pairing strength came from the mode versus the very high energy stuff? Is ah, there any way to separate mm -hmm. that out? Uh, yes, yes, we did. Uh, so, mm -hmm. of course, the, the, the uh, the mode itself you know, uh, is not really uh, a pairing boson because that's that's observed only in the superconducting state. Okay, so the more proper way of uh, phrasing this is, you know, what fraction of the pairing strength comes from uh, excitations very close to pi pi, and what from you know from, from uh, high energy spin excitations. 
Okay, and I have a, uh, uh, I have a plaque that was related to the follow-up study at Optima doping now, you know, based on with the inelastic X-ray spectrum data. I can you know, uh, tell you precisely um, the different contributions, the different uh, ranges of momentum. But of course, uh, the major part uh, of the parallel strength actually does come from pi pi, uh, from excitations close to pi pi. Okay, but uh, even you know. The, Excitations of the order of 100 millivectron volts, according to these calculations, make a significant contribution to TC. Okay, so it's not negative. Yeah. Also, like, um, this is based on the triple axis data, right? Like, this was based on triple axis data. If you look at the time of flight data, right, which has very good Q resolution, it doesn't appear that this upper branch is so sharp. The time of flight data, which is not as much this upper branch is quite broad, and then wouldn't that smear out this, um, you know, this cave? But if you're going through, if you're cutting this very steeply dispersing branch, it's very broad and few, mm -hmm. you're cutting it through it up, then you're not going to get a, you know, there's not going to be no crossing, it's going to be like a chain. Well, I mean, this thing, of course, is not very sharp, right? So that's, right. that's the, so we've taken the actual, uh, neutron scattering spectrum, you know, with broadening everything, right? Uh, that we really measure, right? Uh, and we fit it. But you can hold it, right? Hmm? This is, this is a, your, your, like this upper branch, right? If I have a flight data, it's not that sharp at all. It's, 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 if you do a cut, do a constant, uh, mm -hmm. energy cut, and you look at the flight data, then you can see that, you know, you're not going to get, like, a broad function on peak, you're going to get a broad peak. And so then if you see you see that the green line is crossing that mm -hmm. sharp line, but if you make that, you know, like five times broader, then it will never cross it. It will just like Well, I mean, okay, so uh, and the kink you may get the kink you need to have a crossing. Like one of the crossing well, okay, so this would not produce very sharp kinks, right? Uh, but, you know, in the what is the old data, you know, there was no really very, very sharp kink, and uh, also in the data. So, and as far as this particular sample, this particular data set, uh, you know, the, um, just coupling the experimentally observed spirit fluctuations uh, to you know, fermions actually Okay, reasonable description of these um, uh, photo emission dispersions. Okay, uh, so if there is a very sharp kink, uh, then yeah, I would agree with you. You know, if you see a very sharp kink in the photo emission spectrum, that is likely not due to spin okay. So this is nodal kink, right? Yes. And um, when you go towards the anti node, you do find much sharper kinks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then. Uh, uh, and those are <laughs> ones that. Yeah. So you and you also see, see you know, the antinodes are connected by, by the sharp pi. fluctuations. And by the pi yes. pi. So you might think those are more related yes. to the, yes. and, and should be, I, I think if you're going to search for the connection mm -hmm. between the neutron scattering and the, these ARPAS things, I think that's a much better place to look yes, for Yes, yes, yes. Uh, actually, actually, in this paper, we also show um, antinodes. Some like that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, it's the full photo uh, emission data set that was actually fitted. Um, and you're right, and the, uh, so these kinks are uh, sharper uh, in the antinomal corrections. But on the other hand, you know, I don't want to exclude uh, that some of this, uh, these kinks come from phonons. Actually, I think uh, now we see phone, very strong phonon anomalies. They probably also contribute to the, to the, to the kinks. And, so, uh, and of course, if you, know, if you include this phonon contribution, then you know this uh, prediction would again be lowered, right? So if there's, you know, there's spin fluctuations are then just one contributor to the kinks, or experimentally observed kinks. So if you, if you take phonons into account, you know then the spin fermion coupling constant would actually be lower than um, if you don't take them into account, and uh, that would is another mechanism that uh, could lead to. It. Lower this prediction. Well, that's not necessarily true, actually, because the phonon anomalies are very nice crop, in fact, they tend to reinforce the, uh, they only connect the, the plus plus side. So, 
the D wave gap. Where yes. the luminates are, those wave factors. And in the diagonal direction, they would suppress this. But it's not really, it won't be, there are no fun on those. Right? Yeah, okay, they are so different wave factors. Well, you know, they, they are based at the, at the charge density wave factors. Right, near, near, yeah. Right. Yes. So in these wave factors, you can act at plus and plus side. That's true. Yeah. Yes. So they will not suppress the Possibly. Because the only way someone is lower to see is if they can have the minus side and the plus side. Yeah, but that may be too naive, actually. So, so, you know, so we're constantly sort of revising our thinking about the pronouns. And at the moment, uh, you know, we, we associate all these phonon dispersion anomalies that you and we together have observed now with the charge density wave. Okay, they have the same wave vector. And the charge density wave competes against superconductivity. Okay? And therefore, these phonon dispersion anomalies also are very strongly changed at TC. Okay? Uh, and that's an effect that is totally different from, from uh, you know, you know, any kind of naive electron photon coupling that you could write down, you know, LDA or whatever. Right? So, so it's a, I think one really has to rethink completely the influence of phonons on the photomission spectrum, right? based on the, uh, what we now know about the charge density wave and its competition. It's at least my question. <laughs> It's a subject, subject of current research. Yes. Okay. Well, I guess uh, I don't have time to go into the domestic X-ray scanning, so I will just basically defer this to tomorrow because my time seems to be up. No further questions, then uh, we'll continue tomorrow.